We're very happy to have uh, Sumia Sankar, who's going to be talking about curves over finite scales. So you can take it away. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Alvaro. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to, um, to run this course. Um, I'm like really glad to be here. I was at CTNT 2016 as a student, and um, it was one of the most important summer schools I attended as a grad student. So it was a great experience. Um, and uh, it's really sad that we can't all um, be in per like be in stores in person, um, but what are you gonna do, right? Okay. Um, and of course, I, I should like um, the organizers deserve a lot of credit for because like organizing a conference is a huge um, amount of work, and transferring all of it online is is a massive undertaking. Um, and they did a fantastic job. Um, so, uh, I'm going to lead the course in Curves of a Finite Field. My lecture notes are already uh, on Piazza, so uh, you should be able to find them on the resources tab on Piazza. Um, and uh, so, the, there's a bunch of exercises that are within the bod body of the notes that sort of fit into the narrative. But there's also some extra ones that are a little outside um, or are mo more like supplementary material. Um, which are at the end of the lecture notes. Um, now, these are still a work in progress, so uh, I'm going to keep adding more exercises um, and don't feel pressured to do all of them while um, during this, during CTNT. The great advantage of everything being online is that um, you can look at things later. So if at some point, so attending an online workshop is hard. Uh, or uh, online summer school is hard. It, it's more exhausting than you think it is. Um, so if at any point you need to like step back and like um, step away from screens, um, absolutely you should feel free to do that. And um, uh, yeah, so so remember to take care of yourself. It's very easy to like uh, to be get excited about all of the math and then forget to like eat properly and drink enough water and sleep well. So make sure you do all of those things. Okay, great. Um, so let's get started. Um, so the plan for today is to talk about elliptic curves over finite field. Um, and uh, the main reference, um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about various aspects of elliptic curves. Of course, one could write a book on this and there are multiple books on this. Um, <laughs> And um, so the, the main reference for this is going to be Silverman's book. Um, I've tried to put most of the um, most of the stuff that you need in the lecture notes, or at least like a link to them or something. But if you want, uh, if you don't have access to Silverman's book, then let me know, and we'll find a way of working around it. Right. Um, so this is called um, Arithmetic of Elliptic Curves. Is the canonical text on elliptic curves. Um, so that's the main reference. Okay, great. So um, just to start, let's set down some notation, right? So FQ is going to be a finite field with Q elements. Um, Q elements. Um, Q is going to be a power of P, where P is a prime. Right. Um, right. So one of the most important maps that we will come across in characteristic P things is the Frobenius map. Right. So it's a map from FQ to FQ that sends A to A to the Q. Right. And this map. So may I there is, there is a question. Let me see. If, um, somebody wants to ask one question. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, hello. I have a question about um, Silverman's elliptic curves book. So I was looking at it. Um, I was thinking about reading it this summer, but I noticed it uses a lot of references from Hartshorn that go through up to about two, three hundred pages of Hartshorn. Do you think you need to read Hartshorn before you read Silverman? Uh, I did not. I still have not read all of Hartshorn. Um, okay. So. Uh, well, so I think no. So, so the short answer is no. But um, 
at some point in your life, you should do those exercises or at least like try to absorb what they mean. So I think in, in his first and second chapter, in the first and second chapter of Silverman, he also like gives you a little bit of like algebraic geometry background that you need to know this, right? Um, so uh, you can try to like internalize the statements without actually going through all of hard charms, right? Okay. So that's like the alternative to not like reading hard charms. Um, but at some point, you're okay to like go through your so it's okay to take your time. With okay, all right, thank you. I, I was just curious because I was gonna read it with a friend, but he didn't want to like take 300 pages of hard as a black box, and I told him it was probably fine, but uh, I was just curious. But, uh, thank you. Be fine. All right, cool. Okay. Whenever you need to, you can go back to it. Yeah, all right, anyways. So, uh, yeah, okay, so this um, sigma, uh, this is called the Frobenius map. This generates the Gawa group of FQ over F. Right. Um, so let's define an elliptic curve. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna define an elliptic curve by the following um, homogeneous polynomial. So I'm going to um, define it as y squared z plus a1 xyz plus a3 yz squared equals x cubed plus a2 x squared z plus a4 xz squared plus a6 z cubed. Right. So I'm going to define an elliptic curve as the set of solutions this equation. Right? Um, so note a few things. So this is a cubic equation, right? So this is cubic and it's homogeneous. It means in particular that it defines um, that it defines a curve F curve in P2, right? So it's in projective space. Right. Um, so projective space is basically you can think of it as a set of two folds, um, X, Y, Z, right, mod some equivalence relation where you can, you're allowed to scale these as as you like. So for instance, one 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 is the same as two 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 in projective space, right? So um, you can think of it as the set of these two folds, um, and so. An elliptic curve is going to be the set of solutions to this. And um, just as a notation, if k is some extension of fq, right, so extension of fields, then you can talk about ek, and this is going to denote the set of solutions to this equation in k. So this is just notation. Um, right. So what we're going to do for for um, notational convenience is we're going to a um, we're going to dehomogenize this equation, right? Right. And what that means is the following: whenever you have an, a homogeneous equation, so let's do a simple example: y squared z plus z cubed. Right, so I can divide the whole thing by z cubed, right, and then set little x equal to capital X over z, and little y equal to capital Y over z, and apply this transformation here. So I just get x cubed plus y squared plus one equals zero. Right, so um, this actually amounts to if you notice what this does is that this amounts to setting z equal to one in your equation. Right? And so instead of studying solutions th to this, right, we're going to study solutions to this one, right? Uh, to the dehomogenized word version. Now, in the process of doing that, what are we missing? Well, 
We're missing. So we're missing d equal to zero, right? So let me write down the dehomogenized version of the elliptic curve that I wrote down earlier. So you get y squared plus a one x y plus a three y equals x cubed plus a two x squared plus a four x plus a six, right? Um, and so what are you missing? You're missing z equal to zero. And what you notice is that if in this equation, in the original equation, if you said z equal to zero, intersected with original equation, is basically this point, zero, one, zero. Right? And we're gonna call this the point at infinity. So you just think of an elliptic curve as, an e as a cubic defined by this equation, along with this point at infinity, which this equation doesn't see. Okay. Um, I'm going to make a couple more reductions. And I'm going to leave these reductions as exercises. Right. So, um, if you look at this equation, it's a little bit clunky to write, that, write it down every time. But what happens is if, if the characteristic of your field is not equal to two, um, it, it's not equal to two, then what you can do is you can write this as y squared equals fx, where fx is some cubic polynomial. So you, you, you will have to make some sort of transformations over here, right? So like y goes to y plus a1x or a1x over two, whatever, some, the right, the right transformation, right? I'd love to work that out. If b is not equal to two or three, and there's an even simple form, which is given by this, ax plus b, so a, b are in f cube, right? Or whatever field you're defined the elliptic curve is defined over and um right so this is called the short y stress form and a third exercise if e equals two you can check that the best you can do with your transformations is the following you can write this as y squared equal minus y right equals fx, where f is now a rational function. A rational function. So, um, so, so you can show that well, in the corresponding characteristics, an elliptic curve can always be written in one of these forms. Okay, so just for notational convenience, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna assume that we're we're in this case, right? Although a lot of definitions make sense even when the characteristics are two and three, but I want to be able to use um, this equation, so I'm just going to assume from now. Assume that e is given by y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. So I defined the elliptic curve, but I lied about something that I that wasn't a complete definition. So I'm going to insist that my curve be smooth, that E is smooth, right? So which means is that, so this basically means it has no corners. Um, there's an exercise in, in at the end of the notes that actually uh, tells you what the exact equations are in order to determine whether something is smooth. And using that, you can show, so you can show that what that means for an elliptic curve, that E is smooth if and only if for A cubed, 27B squared is non-zero. So, 
right? So the, the, the exercise is walk you through this, so don't worry about it um, too much. So we're going to assume that this is true. And um, I'm going to define the J invariant, although we won't use it as much. Um, and you have seen this in the password to this, to this set of um, uh, meetings. The J invariant is defined as 1728. Uh, times 4a cubed over 4a cubed plus b, 27b squared. Right. And the J invariant is actually a very important invariant of the elliptic curve in that it, it, it determines it up to isomorphism over the algebraic closure, right? So when people study elliptic curves, it's like a, when, when people study families of elliptic curves, um, this sort of uh, becomes extremely important, right? But for now, we're not going to, this won't come up for us as much. Questions. Okay, I'm not seeing anything or hearing anything, so I'm gonna go on. Oh, um, so yeah, there, there was a typo at the very beginning. I think may, it might be also in the notes in the current form in the draft. Uh, where the generator of Frobenius was uh, the qth power instead of the pth power. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yep. Right. That's all. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm not going to scroll up enough, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 The yeah. work. And also, is it possible to zoom out a little bit? The the writing is a little big. Maybe if can you zoom out any in your notes. It's better. Yeah. Yeah. That would be nice. Uh, so we can see a little bit more of above. Thank you. I'm gonna try to write smaller. I don't know if I can. Let's see. Let's see if this helps. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Oops. That's my bad. Um, okay. Cool. Um, so one thing that I'm gonna talk about. So, um, is so because E is defined by a bunch of equations, you can um. So, uh, so E is algebraic, right? So you can talk about um, you can talk about functions on E, right? So this is exactly what you think it is, right? So E is some curve, and so maybe you want to think of um, uh, like taking points and then mapping them to something, right? So there are functions on E, functions. On e, right? So um, there's like a more complicated way of defining this, but the way we will think about it, right? So we're going to denote, so this is the ring of functions on E is going to be um, K adjoin XY. So where K is whatever field E is defined over, over, um, so modded out by this ideal cubed minus ax minus b. Okay. So we're just going to denote this. Um, we're going to think of the ring of functions on E as this as this ring. And we're going to call it k square brackets E. Right? So you can replace k here by fq, fb, where, wherever E is defined. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and then you can also talk about the function field of E. And um, that is basically, I'm going to denote it by K adjoint round bracket E. And this is going to be the fraction field of KE. Right. So whenever you have a map of two um, elliptic curves, right? so if you have a map between two elliptic curves, and um, right, so what it so what you can do is you can and and you have some function on e, right? What you can look at k e prime. There's an induced map from k e prime to k of e, which basically sends um, well, if you have some other function g here, right? Oops, my bad. Sorry. Uh, let me adjoin e. So, um, 
So you take G and what can you do with it? Well, you want you have a function on E and you want to create a function on, uh, so you have a function on E prime and you want to create a function on E. Well, what, what can you do? You just pre-compose with that function, right? So you just take, um, so you take, So you pre-compose with X, and that gives you a function on E. And um, if this map is non-constant, right? So if this map is non-constant, then um, this is actually an injection, right? And so it defines an extension of function field. So what this means is that if you want to study this map of curves e to e prime, then you can. Uh, so a lot of times, what we will do instead is study this map, this this extension of field, right? And then we can apply all of the Galois theory and all of the stuff that we know from Galois theory to this um, to this extension of field, right? Um, that's that's sort of the goal of, of this part, right? Of, of like studying the function fields of E instead. Okay, any questions? Recep has a question. Um, uh, is there a reason why the coefficients of the polynomial that defines an elliptic curve are indexed not in that order? Uh, why a1, a3, a2, a4, a6? Uh -huh. um, possible question. Um, so, okay, I think like different people have different answers to this. Um, but my favorite answer is that they sort of are um, related to these things called modular forms. And um, they, oh. and, and so these a1 through, well, through a6 have certain have um, are, are related to modular something called modular form and uh, the indices correspond to like the weights of the modular forms so weights. Um, I don't know if Alvaro has a better answer uh, Alvaro is the go to elliptic curves person. Well, um, my answer typically is that um, if you look at the entire polynomial and you put uh, uh, weights on X and Y, but there are, they, they come with different weights. So um, the the weight of uh, what is it? The weight of X is three. The X the weight of X is two. The weight of Y is three. Then each monomial has a weight. And the coefficient below a is the weight of that monomial. Um, that has to do with the fact that also when you do a change of variables on the bias stress equation, the that weight of the monomial comes in in into play. That when you do a change of variables, just uh, change um, x and y, you scale them. Then sort of like each coefficient changes by a power of that scalar. That is, a1 changes by a1 times that scalar to the first power, a3 changes a3 times the third power of the scalar. Um, so it's, it's helpful. It's sort of confusing with the first time you see it, but it's helpful to remember um, for, for those changes of variables. Okay. Yeah, that's a much better answer than the one that I gave. Okay, thank you, Alvaro. Um, okay, great. Um, so, all right, great question. Um, so now I'm going to move on to something that's like more characteristic E, and that's something called the Frobenius twist. So um, if I have E, which is given by, oops, uh, is given by y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, um, then I'm going to define the Frobenius twist as the following, y squared equals x cubed plus a to the p x plus b to the p, okay? So 
Um, so, th so this is called the Frobenius twist. And um, in general, there's a map from E to EP that sends XY to X to the P, Y to the P. And you can check that this is, um, that if XY satisfies this equation, then X to the P, Y to the P satisfies this one. Right? Um, and so, uh, and also note that, okay, so two things, right? First of all, you can make sense of this with um, any power, with, with like any power of Frobenius, right? So you can just do EUP to the R, right? Where instead, instead of instead of raising things to the P's power, you raise things to P at P to the R's power, right? So you can define it sim similarly. And second is that if E is defined over the base field, right? So if E is defined over FB, right, then E is literally equal to E. Um, I'm just gonna write E equal to EB. Okay, great. Right, because if you're over FB, then the then E to the P is is A. Great. Um, and so what does that tell us? It tells us that this, um, so I'm gonna give this a name, I'm gonna call this prob P. And what this tells us is that prob P acts on an elliptic curve over FP, right? So I can think of it as an endomorphism of E. Um, and um, just, and, and if you make sense of part one, then prob Q, acts on an elliptic curve over FQ. Okay. And so this is going to be an extremely important map for us. Okay. okay. So what else do we want to study about elliptic curves? Another thing that we want to study is the number of points. Okay. So right now it seems like I'm going through one topic after the other, but the reason for doing that is basically that these are the things that we're going to generalize to higher higher genus curves later, right? So um, that's why it seems like a lot of topics all at once. Um, so number of points on an elliptic curve E. So what do I want to do? I want to study the number of FQ points on an elliptic curve that's defined over FQ. Um, and before I go ahead, I'm going to define something called the Legendre symbol. It's the following. So if B is some um, integer, you can actually define this. Um, oh, not. I want a Q here. Okay. So this is going to be, so you may have seen this before. So this is going to be one if B is a square, or maybe I want to start with zero. So I want to, it's zero if B is zero mod Q, right? This is defined as negative one if B is not a square mod Q, and one if B is a non-zero square, not zero mod Q. Right? So this is how I'm gonna define this. And what you can, and you may wonder why I'm trying to do this. Well, if I fix, so if I fix X inside FQ, right, I want to know when um, you can get a Y inside FQ where such that Y squared equals XQ plus AX plus Z. Right? That's what it means to be a point on this elliptic curve. So the number of FQ points is going to be determined by whether or not this is a square mod Q, right? Um, okay, so I shouldn't say mod Q, I should say in FQ. Um, that's probably the right thing to say. You know what I mean, hopefully. So in FQ is the right, th right way to say these. 
not working in the QC. Okay, awesome. Um, so, um, great. So I want to know when this is a square. So let's so let's define AX as x cubed plus AX plus B, the Legendre symbol corresponding to that. So what we've determined is that the number of points on the elliptic curve right, is going to be the sum of 1 plus ax over x inside fq, right, plus something else. But this part, right, the reason for this is a 1 plus ax is that if ax is 1, which means it's a non-zero square, it means you get two distinct y values because y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. Similarly, if you have, if AX is negative one, then you get no points, right? So that contributes to zero. And if, um, and if AX is zero, then you get exactly one point, right? So that's why it's one plus AX. And then we said that elliptic curves also have a point at infinity, which is a rational point at zero, one, zero. Well, it's an FQ rational point. Um, so plus one. This tells us that it, that this is q plus one my, um, plus um, the sum over ax x inside fq, right? So it becomes the sum of these like easily computable um, symbols, right? Uh, and so you can use this often to compute um, a lot of different kinds of um, things about like number of points. Let's just put the size here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this be equal to something. So a q of e, I'm going to define this as a negative of the sum of these a x's, right? And and so what this tells us is the size of e of q is q plus one minus a q. Right? Sometimes I'm going to omit the e if e is clear. And it turns out that these things are actually very important. And there's a lot of things that have been proved about these. Um, and so there is this theorem it's called the Hasse way bound. It, um, although for, for elliptic curves, this was proved by Hasse. Um, and that says that AQ, is, the absolute value of AQ is bounded above by two square root Q. So what this says is that E roughly has Q points, right? Um, well, Q plus one points up to an error term of square root Q, right? So that's one way of thinking about what this says, right? And um, so the, uh, there's um, the notes sort of like say a little more about what some, some of the places where these AQs arise. And so if you're interested, Good place to look up something. Uh, I have 15 minutes, right? Yep, yeah, your talk goes until 3.30, it's 2.40 to 3.30, so you still have like 15 minutes. Okay, great. Any questions so far? So now I'm going to talk about something called the L-torsion of an elliptic curve. And for that, we're going to use the following fact, um, which is that E comes equipped with an, uh, any elliptic curve has a group structure. There is one question, Somia. Um, is there any particular reason AQ has that sign convention? Yeah, that's a good question. So we'll actually see this in like um, in the next uh, section. So um, but by the end of this this place where I talk about the L torsion, um, this is going to be related to the to the Frobenius, and then so there is a reason, and we will see it by the end of this lecture. That's the answer. <laughs> Sorry, I, I I tend to ramble a little bit. 
if I don't answer it by the end of this lecture, let me know and I will I will talk about it. Awesome. Okay. So E comes equipped with a group structure, and maybe you've seen this on like um, the covers of various books. Um, at least when E is defined over R, or you can think of like the R points of E. Right. I'm going to draw the real picture. Um, because I feel like I'm obligated to draw it whenever I'm talking about elliptic curves. But um, if you have a point P and you have a point um, Q, then the way to uh, the way to determine the um, the group structure or how you how you determine um, P plus Q is the following: you just draw a line through these, and then there are some theorems that tell you that it will necessarily intersect the elliptic curve at another point. This point can lie on the elliptic curve, or it can be the point at infinity, but um, there's definitely some point. We call this R, and the group structure is determined by setting P plus Q plus R equal to zero, okay. where zero is the identity, and this is taken to be the point at infinity. And you can you can show that this uh, satisfies the usual group properties. Um, and so maybe you're wondering, well, I've been defining an elliptic curve over a finite field. This picture does not make sense over a finite field. What do you do then? Well, you can still make sense of this algebraically, right? So if you write down the coordinates for P and Q, you can write down the equation of the line that passes through them. And then you can see where that line uh, intersects the elliptic curve. So all of this makes sense algebraically. And so you can use the same equations that you get from this picture in order to actually determine the group structure, even for uh, even for other fields. Okay. So we're just going to use this fact. But what this allows us to do is that it allows us to talk about things that you can talk about with groups, right? So for instance, there's the following definition. So if you have two elliptic curves, a map between them called um, is an isogeny, right? Um, if it satisfies the following conditions, so it is A, a homomorphism, right? B, it's surjective on FQ bar points. Right? Um, and has finite kernel. P, right? So if you look at these physically, if you look at the physical points that are inside this kernel, right? This is finite. Right? So that's what an isogeny is. So we've already seen an example of an isogeny, um, and an example is the Frobenius map from E to E P, right? This is an isogeny. Um, the, an exercise sort of walks you through what this isogeny is and, um, well, also the degree of the isogeny, which I'll define in a bit. The other example is multiplication by n. Right, so you can take a point P and map it to n times that point. And this also turns out to be an isogeny. Right? And so, Given an isogeny, you can define um, definition. You can define the degree of the isogeny. So remember that we talked about um, whenever you have a map of two elliptic curves that's not constant, right? That doesn't extend everything to zero, for instance. Um, you get a map of the f of function fields, right? You get a field extension. So the degree of phi. P is defined to be the degree of this field extension. And so if you go back to our examples, then it turns out, so, um, so it turns out that this is an isogeny of degree P. And this is an isogeny of degree N squared. Um, so the exercise also walks you through this part. Um, this is a little more complicated, so I won't, I won't really talk about that. Um, but 
yeah so it's a, it's it's an it's an isogeny of degree n squared um okay well do you want to sit and compute the degree of the field extension every time maybe not right um here is another way to think about this so if if degree of phi and p which is the characteristic are co prime then it turns out so this is a fact um that uh the, the size of the kernel uh, of um so you look at all the fq bar points right inside the kernel and the size is exactly equal to the degree of phi right so if you literally count the number of points that map to zero you can tell what the degree of phi is you need this co primeness condition. So, um, putting all of this together, what this says in particular, if n and p are co prime, then if you look at the kernel of the um, multiplication by n map, right? So, this, um, so this is often called the n torsion so, so this is called the n torsion of the elliptic curve and the kernel is actually isomorphic to z mod n z squared okay so you should take fq bar points here just to be careful but basically all of the things that map to zero, there's n squared of them, and um, it's isomorphic to z mod n z squared. So what are we going to do with all of this? We're going to take this information and we're going to package it, package it into one, one single object, right? So this definition of something called the Tate module, right? So let's say L is some prime not equal to p okay. so we know that from this above observation that e l to the n is isomorphic to z mod l to the n z squared okay. further notice that we have these maps so if you have e l to the n plus one right so this means oh wait i didn't define what e oh, sorry my bad so by e So this I'm going to write as EN. So this is standard notation, right? So this is the N torsion, the elliptic curve. My bad, sorry. Uh, great. So if you look at the L to the N torsion, then this is isomorphic to Z mod L to the N. Squared. And then from the L to the N plus one torsion, you can construct a map to L to the L to the N torsion by sending, um, uh, by, by basically multiplying whatever your whatever you have by l right so this is the map uh, and so if you have a bunch of these maps what can you do with them well you can put them into an inverse system right uh, i don't want to put the this one so i can take the inverse limit over all of these and this is called the Tate module. And so by this observation, this is isomorphic to ZL squared. Okay, so why, why do we do this? Well, one of the reasons to do this is that, well, look at what we've done, right? We've taken an elliptic curve, which is like an algebraic variety, et cetera, et cetera, and we've converted it, we converted some of the information into um into something that's essentially linear right so for instance if you want to study so if you want to study maps on e so an example is the frobenius map right so note recall that we talked about the frobenius action on e instead of studying it here we can study it on tle right i'm going to call this problem ql 
And so, right, so be, because if E comes with an action of uh, Frobenius, and it turns out that each of these um, n tor uh, L to the n torsion subgroups, these um, these come with an action of Frobenius as well. Right? And then all of those actions, sort of, um, you can put all of them together and get an action on the Tate module itself. And so instead of studying things here, you in, instead of studying things um, on E, you study things on TLE. And what that gives you, oops, And what that gives you is that you can now think of this as a matrix with coefficients in ZL. Right? So you can think of, um, so you've somehow linearized your problem a little bit, right? So you can get a lot of information uh, and, and we like it. We like linear algebra, we can do linear algebra. Other things are hard, um, but linear algebra is, is Relatively doable. Okay, so here is the proposition. Right? You consider this matrix, so prob QL. Right? So since it's a matrix, you can consider it its um, characteristic polynomial. Characteristic polynomial given by the following. E E. I'm going to call this P E Q T. Um, this is T squared minus A Q T plus Q, where these A Qs are the same. Um, so they appeared in the expression for E F Q. Um, and so, okay, I don't know if this is. Um, I don't know how you feel about this, but this is like a really cool thing, right? So somehow you looked at this state module, you constructed it somehow, and then you looked at this matrix and looked at the characteristic polynomial of this matrix and it turned out that the trace of this matrix um, is equal, is somehow related to the number of points on E, right? And I think that's super cool. Um, uh, right, so, so this is like one of the really cool things. Right, and so this also sort of um, explains the sign convention question asked earlier, right? So you want to realize this as a trace, which is why you want it to be like minus AQT. Um, so notice that, so let's talk about a few things. So first of all, the size of EQ, um, EFQ, right? This is um, Q plus one minus AQ which is um, PEQ1, which is kind of reasonable, right? What is, what is an FQ point? Well, an FQ point is something that's fixed by Frobenius, right? By the qth power of Frobenius, you need x to the q, y to the q is equal to x, y. So somehow it's like the fixed part. Of, so it's, it's the, the points that are fixed by Frobenius. And so um, Rubinus acts trivially, so you plug in a one and you should get the right number. Um, second, notice that this, uh, I didn't say anything about um, L. Right? And so this sort of, right, so, so the I, from QL, right, no matter what L is, always has this, as long as it's different from P, always has this characteristic polynomial. So it tells you that the Frobenius acts in the same way on all Tate modules, right? So as long as L is different from the characteristic, you get the same polynomial. This, so this is like, um, yeah, so, so it's part of a greater philosophy. Because of lack of time, I'm not gonna say anything more about that. Um, but the last thing that you should notice is that this is, um, polynomial defined over the integers. In particular, this tells you that the eigenvalues of, of the matrix used are algebraic integers. Okay, so those are the three things that I wanted to observe about this. Um, and tomorrow, we're going to talk about curves of our genus and eventually talk about generalizations of all of these sections that we about for um in, in this lecture so i think i'll end there